Well, I, I think we're probably down a little bit as a total industry in 2019 for some of those factors that you mentioned, but it's still a very solid market and we would, we would project that we'll be at or near 17 million units again. And historically, that'll be one of the five or six best years of auto sales. So, you know, people are working in the U.S. and that's the key enabler uh, to a solid car market. So we think it will be another pretty good year. There was an article in the journal that I've got to ask you about because it had some pretty interesting numbers in terms of the number of vehicles that are on the lots of dealerships across the country at the start of 2019. 3.95 million vehicles on dealership lots at the end of January. That's an increase of 4% month on month. Is that what you're seeing on your lots? And, and why is there this glut, seeming glut out there? Well, I think retail sales slowed down a little bit in January because there was a very strong December and I think our inventories are probably three or four percent higher than I would like them. But you can't tell much about the industry from January and February. March is when sales really kick in. And so none of these factors are too alarming yet. I think we're still in a position to have a solid year, even if it's not quite as good as last what's, year. What's selling hot and what's selling less so? And are you doing more leases or more purchases? Well, it's trucks, 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 you know, and, and SUVs. That's 70% of the market now. We're quite strong in Texas and Oklahoma, so, you know, trucks are a, a big deal. And, yeah, if you can't and sell SUVs. a truck in Texas and Oklahoma, you got a problem, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. They're, they're everywhere, and then there's a new Chevrolet truck coming out, and that'll probably stimulate the segment even How more. How about lease versus purchase? What are people doing? Well, leases have flattened out a bit, primarily because the banks and the captive finance companies at lease, they're getting a little bit cautious about residual values. So I think uh, traditional retail contracts are probably a little more in vogue at the moment. Mm -hmm. Earl, while we have you, just want to ask your philosophy on share buybacks, which I know you guys have have done. Um, when you hear that, uh, you know, they're now saying maybe they shouldn't be allowed or that companies should be paying their workers more, how do you respond to that? Oh, I think uh, capital allocation is critical to having a strong company, and that's, that's a dynamic situation. Last year, we added $600 million in revenue through acquisition, so we grew our company. We invested more than $100 million in our facilities to expand them and modernize them, but then we bought back 14% of our shares because sometime during the year, investors depressed the value of the stocks in our segment, so it became more accretive for us to buy our own acquisitions through buying back our shares. But we look at that monthly and we're in continuous discussions with our board. And, and capital allocation is just how you keep your company strong. So you, you, you have to have that avenue and do what's best for your shareholders. Earl, you've got dealerships in the U United Kingdom. So I want to ask you what your scenario is. If there is a hard Brexit, how could that impact your business? What's, what's the back of the envelope <laughs> impact here? <laughs> Well, I just returned from there two days ago, so I wish I had some understanding of how it was going to, to be resolved. A hard Brexit would not be good for anyone. It would not be good for our businesses because we have many uh, German import brands, Audi, Mercedes, and BMW. But I, I continue to believe that neither side wants a hard Brexit. It's not good for the European Union. It's not good for the U.K., and you just have to believe that cooler heads will prevail.